I'd learned to believe in him, learn to know him, learn to love him, and now I was going to have to learn how to trust him. I was going to have to face my fears of not relying on myself to provide my needs. He was showing me that faith without trust is not faith. Back in November, a few months ago, I was invited to give my testimony of how I became a Christian. I had been an atheist my entire life before then, and I'd never and never even been inside a church before. And I attended this church in a little town in New Brunswick, Canada, and it was the first time I'd ever been in a church, as I say. And I sort of stuck out like a sore thumb there <laughs> as somebody new in town in this uh, small town. And the pastor then asked me if I was a Christian person as we're walking through at the end. And I said, yeah, a pretty new one, actually. Um, had been a lifelong atheist. And he said, you know, you should give your testimony. And before I could even think straight, the words came out of my mouth. And I said, you know what? I'd love to. And uh, it was one of the greatest blessings that I was ever able to do. And I had hoped that in doing so, that it was useful out there to somebody, somehow, some way. And so the only problem was that I'm terrified to speak in public. <laughs> and I had just gotten myself into, I had just agreed to be interviewed twice on the local television station and uh, to stand up before a room full of people and tell a very personal story about my conversion to Christianity and do so in a half an hour. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I, I'm going to read the testimony here again this morning that is a word-for-word -word testimony of what I, what I said that day in front of the church. I still have my notes from that day and I, I wasn't sure how to get started on this channel. There's a bunch of things that I'd like to discuss so over the coming weeks and months and years on this channel. Uh, but I thought it seemed right that the best way to start was to go back to the very testimony of why I'm even here in the first place. So you have to forgive me that I'm going to read this word for word. So I'm going to be looking down, reading off of the page because I'm going to read exactly what I, what I read out to that church back in November of 2020. And uh, in future, the videos won't necessarily always be so long and, and I won't be having everything written out word for word. There won't be any notes or maybe just point form notes, but I was so, so nervous delivering this testimony and had agonized over it and turned myself inside out and edited and re-edited it and, and that. And because I really just wanted to make sure that it was as useful and it was as truthful as possible. And the point of it was not to be about me, but to be helpful to somebody somehow some way as i say and i'm hoping that in redoing it here this morning rereading it here this morning that it's also useful to somebody somehow in some way so uh, what follows is uh, is a reread of my testimony that i gave that morning good morning my name is amy I've been here from Vancouver, BC for a month now. I've been a Christian for seven months since this April after having been a lifelong atheist. This is just my fourth time attending here and any church, anywhere, ever. The exception was the one Catholic wedding I attended. I thought the kneelers were footrests. When the man next to me turned and said, peace be with you, I replied, okay, thanks, um, same to you. I've been given half an hour or so to tell you my testimony of how I converted from a hardened atheist to a Christian after all these years. In some ways, that seems like an awful lot of time to tell my story of turning to God, and yet in other ways, no amount of time seems like enough to explain how I actually got here. Before I tell you how I found God, or more accurately, the story that God actually revealed himself to me, I'll briefly tell you why I thought there could never be a God in the first place how I got to be that hardened atheist to start with. Like many people, sadly, I had a pretty rough upbringing. From my earliest memories, my home and family 
were saturated in alcohol, anger, child abuse, volatility, despair, and chaos coming from all directions. I never had any lack for people or basic material things around me, but in any meaningful sense, I was entirely on my own. So I began to rely only on myself, distrust everyone and everything, and withdraw to an extreme degree. Long before self-isolating and social distancing, I've been covering my face and standing much farther away than six feet from other people. If anyone got too close to me, I would be sure and push them far away so that they would not be able to hurt me or to see my weakness. I know that growing up with an alcoholic father is not a new story. I also know that there are people in this world who have been through much gorier incidents if, if we were to sit around and swap details. In no way to pity myself or to diminish anyone else, I tell you how my situation differed a little bit, only so that you can understand what it resulted in in me and what God alone saw in my life. My situation boiled down to two main themes. One, I'm on my own here. And two, nobody understands. There was not one person or place that was safe to go to for all those many years. The men in my family seriously and repeatedly damaged my psyche as I grew up. When I tried to get them to stop, they made fun of me and hurt me even more. The women in my family looked the other way, made excuses, didn't believe me or let me know that the fault was with me. Any relative who didn't fall into one of those categories had either died or run away from the family. I did not feel just like I was on my own, didn't just feel like I was on my own. I was on my own. I was on my own. Looking back, though, I suppose God was always with me, even when I didn't know it. I say truly that I could have died or been seriously injured multiple times, but somehow I narrowly escaped each one. But I didn't actually think about God at all in those early years. All I could ever do was try and make it through from moment to moment. I was constantly anxious as the tension built up. I was hypervigilant for the next sudden flash of danger. I tiptoed on what felt like a tinder dry forest floor that was ready to catch fire at the slightest spark. I sat on the edge of my seat behind a closed and locked door, just clenching my teeth and my fists and holding my breath. If I can just make it until I'm an adult, I told myself, I'm getting out of here for good. Just stay away from them, Amy, all of them, and stay under the radar. My childhood made me feel alone in the world, but it also made me feel insane inside because no one seemed to see my perspective except for me. If I tell people a little bit about my father, my grandfather, and my uncles, I sense they want to know whether I was hit or whether they crossed other lines into the most unspeakable of acts. I've never forgotten all the name-calling. So I started calling myself the whole list of the very same words that they used. Six sticks and stones, though, as the saying goes. Or I am rubber and you are glue. That's what a lot of people seem to think. Well, that's quote-unquote not that bad. When I open up about the daily looming physical threat of being a tiny little six-year-old girl, alone with four men, six feet and 300 pounds each, raging, debauched, and too drunk to even walk straight, let alone be babysitting me or driving me in a car. Shoulder shrug. They're waiting for the story about the strap and the black eyes, and they don't really flinch. No matter how many times I was supposedly accidentally pushed into the walls or into the edges of countertops and dinner tables, had the wind knocked out of me in so-called hugs, was stepped on, trapped somewhere, or made to stumble and fall down as a joke to entertain the adults around me. Oh well, as long as there were no closed fists, right? As for the unspeakable, well, I had another version of this written when I thought I only had five or ten minutes here. That version omitted any real detail of abuse or trauma beyond a hint. Even with a longer time, though, 
I wanted to gloss over that part in polite company. I've had many years and many thousands of dollars worth of trauma therapy to be this put together, people. Besides, what's the point rehashing it? I said to myself, God, however, seems to have other plans as he often does, I'm, lear I'm learning. And he's really been pressing hard on my heart about this. And it is right. And there is good reason to tell you the whole truth, not the overly sanitized halfway feel-good truth of my conversion. Two things rather suddenly flooded my consciousness as I struggled with this. A phrase from Isaiah 61 and two of the Psalms, 38 and 147, which say that the Lord binds up the brokenhearted. My story is to speak the message that people do not know God because in this world, with its circumstances, their hearts become hard. Hard-hearted people, even if they don't want to admit it, are just broken-hearted people in disguise. My story is also to speak the message that God indeed can and does redeem the very hard, the very broken, and the very lost. I'm a living example of it, but how can I illustrate the truth of how he set me free if you don't know what he's freed me from? The second thing that stuck hard on my forehead was the Sermon on the Mount. Besides feeling alone as a child, the second and more damaging theme was that no one really gets it, because honestly, they really don't. As it turns out, though, Jesus gets it full well, and that's evidenced by how he expands upon the written laws of the commandments and explains that the sin, which is the crime of a thing, is actually found within the intent, in the heart, not merely in the physical action. The key to my heartbreak my own hardening and disbelief lies in the exact thing that I don't want to say here today, the unspeakable stuff. Again, it seems people want to know if there were body parts involved, which ones where, so that they can figure out what word to call it, or they can decide how bad it was. Jesus Christ knows what was in the hearts of my male relatives. He knows what I grew up with from with from them was exactly what I always thought it was. It was exactly what I always tried to say it was. Though I have numerous memories about wild inappropriateness and lewdness, I can't remember properly or prove things about body parts. It's a case closed as far as the world is concerned. Yet the world never could sufficiently explain to me why from childhood to mid-twenties, when I took a bath, the same certain body parts suddenly began to feel strange, and they hurt, and I was nauseous. Or why even amongst my friends who had body image issues, I was the only one who showered wearing a bathing suit or a tank top, even as a married woman. I've seen my friends' uncles give them funny looks over the years. But I've never seen anyone's uncle look at their niece the way mine eyed me and my sisters. I've seen fathers brush their hair away or sweep it to the side, never paw at it. I've attended a lot of Christmas dinners, but never saw other grandfathers pass around the Playboy centerfolds over dessert and coffee in front of the children. I've heard a lot of pet names and seen a lot of dad joke emails from fathers to their daughters. I've never heard anyone else's dad call them sexy lady, no matter how drunk they were, or email them pornography with the subject line reading, for old time's sake. But it was all in my head, the world says, crazy, oversensitive Amy, overreacting about everything. She's the only one that's got the problem. She needs to lighten up. My mind started shattering into pieces. Eventually, my body, my skin, actually went physically numb because it was too painful to inhabit. It's devastating to be bullied as a child. It is surreal to be expected to buy your bully a birthday gift the following week. So yes, I got hardened. I got angry. No, I got enraged. 
my thoughts were still not on the existence of God very much, but if they were, they were now angry thoughts because I raged. What sort of a God lets a child go through something like this? As things spiraled down, I went from a quiet, sensitive little girl to someone bitter and jaded. Layers upon layers, more abuse and trauma piled up on me, and I threw it back at others, angry at everyone, everything. The world at large, just for carrying on nonchalant as I was drowning and dying every day right in front of them. I started lying, at first to cover up the embarrassing truths at the bottom of this, to reinvent reality into something more palatable, or to protect my friends from being targets too. But eventually I weaved such elaborate webs of BS that I needed a notebook to keep the details straight. I told whoppers that were nothing short of disgusting, that deeply hurt people that truly cared about me, and a few that were literally criminal. I stole because I felt the world owed me a break. I was blessed repeatedly with people that loved me and tried to help me, but I systematically drove most of them off with my behavior. Eventually, I ended up getting high or drunk every day myself, smashing up my apartment, eating my way close to 300 pounds, cheating on my husband, collecting disability benefits, and getting myself locked up in the psych ward after having slashed my arms from wrist to shoulders and swung at the police. In short, I ended up becoming the same type of monster that I was trying to escape from. I spent many years flat on my face in society's gutters before I became able to function and to control myself. When my mind and my body finally got well, the downside was I viewed myself with even more self-reliant pride because I had managed to beat all the odds. People like me don't usually end up talking in churches and beautiful little seaside towns. They end up living on the streets. That is if they live at all. I'd stopped running people off because I was scared or hateful of them. I just decided that I had no use for anyone at all anymore since I was such the strong and clever one. I was no longer unstable, but I was more of a robot than a person. A few years ago, I started searching for answers. Not about God per se, but about the world, because I was seeing that things were not always as I had assumed them to be. I researched politics history, the occult, and a lot of my long-held opinions reversed when I actually investigated things. Each layer revealed a layer beneath. It started looking endless and like my entire concept of reality had been all lies. I became determined to get to the bottom of what the truth was. I had no idea what this master ultimate truth would be, but I resolved that I would either know it when I found it or I would die trying to figure it out because I wasn't stopping until I got to it. One day, I experienced the last thing I ever expected to happen. I encountered God. In my researching, I had gradually softened to the possibility that God might be real, but the idea went on the back shelf. I wanted to solve the riddle of how the world worked and was focused on the political, the rich, the powerful. I decided that I was willing to accept whatever the truth about the world ended up being because I'd been proven wrong about so much else. But still, this would have to be an ironclad intellectual truth because I did not want to get fooled again. But then, on an otherwise normal day, out of nowhere, I somehow understood a message from within myself. It was not an audible voice or my own thought, but something I had never experienced before or since. It was along the lines of, do you really want to know the truth? Here's the truth, but will you accept it? At once, I had an awareness of sorts that didn't seem to be my own. It seemed like either another person's mind was dropped into me or some obstruction was yanked away from my own. Somehow I perceived that, of course God is real. He's alive. He's the one and only God. The Bible is his book and every word he says in it is true. Obviously. Duh. As if I had always believed so and wasn't the smuggest of lifelong mockers. Totally out of character, I did choose to accept that, okay, I guess I'll fill in all the details later, but yes, I do believe this all for some reason. The second half of the message told me, you cannot find answers to spiritual questions with your head. You must use your heart. 
Shocking as it seemed, I had no alternative explanation for what just happened except for this was truly God contacting me somehow. I ran down the list several times over the next little while. Was I dreaming? No, it was the middle of the afternoon. Was I going crazy? No, because I actually do know what that's like and it's nothing like this. I hadn't used alcohol or drugs in years, so it wasn't substance induced. I wasn't influenced by anybody because I avoid all people. The churches are closed, and this is precisely the last thing that would earn me social rewards where I come from. I hadn't gotten obsessed with the Bible because I'd barely picked it up yet. I had to keep coming back to the same conclusion. Whoa, that really was God. Soon after, I went onto a hiking trail and I prayed for the first time in my life. I had no clue what to do or say, but I just started sincerely pouring my heart out to God, apologizing for how wrong I was in my unbelief, regretting all my rotten deeds, sobbing instead of raging, and being genuinely grateful that for whatever reason, he came and gave some wretched little nobody like me the truth. The first little while, I was fumbling around like a newborn, confused. I remember I didn't want to pray too often at first because I thought, God must be super busy with major world leaders and things much more important than me. And I don't want to bother him while he's working. Maybe I'll just call him once a week or something. Every morning I started waking up with this thought, yeah, okay, so God is real then, but why you? Are you losing it again? Starting to do weird and stupid things in your life? Are you sure that God would really talk to a middle-aged medical transcriptionist who lives with her mom? Are you serious? So every day I ran down the list again and again, not dreaming, not drunk, not in a cult, functioning fine at work, and why else would I have such a strong belief about the last thing I expected to be true? I started pleading, Lord, I don't know if this is my own mind fighting me, something evil is trying to mess me up, or you're testing my faith. I begged him to take the doubt away if he would, saying, I want to move forward with you rather than in circles going down this mental checklist every day to prove that you're real. You've already done so to the world and to me personally. Lord, help me get this doubt out of here once and for all so I can come to know you. Very soon after, other challenges arose, but doubt was never one of them again. I asked the Lord to take it away, and it went away. (laughs) I settled into a routine over the next while, which was really just my old routine plus Jesus interspersed. Work, gym, Jeopardy, sleep, just had prayer and Bible study in between. Okay, I believe now. So what? I heard someone say somewhere that even demons believe in Jesus Christ. Even Satan knows God is real. I started thinking, big deal that you're a believer now, Amy. That's step one. I wanted to know him. I used to think the Bible was scary before I'd actually read it. Now the only verse that truly terrifies me is Jesus saying to certain believers at the end, depart from me. I never knew you. I prayed, Lord, you know I'm a total moron and I have no clue what I'm doing. But you came to me. So please, I'm chaining myself to you. I am holding on to your ankle for dear life. I want to be super glued to you and never separated again now that I know you're actually there. I prayed about baptism. He guided me somehow, the way that he does through the muck and the mire of all the doctrinal arguments. I said, Lord, rather than just flapping my lips with empty words at you alone in the dark, I want to do at least one thing to publicly show you and the world that I'm one of yours. I want to commit. I learned of one bold pastor that was preaching on the streets and baptizing while every church I tried to visit or email was closed and didn't answer me. Yes, he's ordained and has all the credentials, but I saw that he clearly had the Holy Spirit, which was the only credential I cared about. I said, Lord, this is the man I would want to baptize me even if I had all the choice in the world because he clearly lives for you, as I also wish to. I got determined that I was going to make my way to Toronto to see if I could be baptized as soon as I could. But first, I got this urgent press on my heart about my oldest sister who's terminally ill and has been estranged, and I knew I had to drop what I was doing that day. I wrote her a letter of forgiveness and peace, prayed for her health, even begging God for her life and offering to take her place instead if I could. And I sent my mom away immediately to go and see her for three weeks. I wanted my mom and my sister to have their time together, 
but I did have a bit of an ulterior motive too. I wanted to really get to know God. These three weeks, I was going all in on God in a way that would probably even freak out most long-term Christians, to be honest. I played no music but worship music. No television but Jesus movies and sermons. Hours of prayer and Bible reading. I took the three Buddha statues that we had in the house and I smashed them to bits with a hammer in my living room. I told God, I'm going to fast for a week. No work, no food, no coffee. I'll live on nothing but water and God for seven days. The two things I love the most in this world that I love far too much sometimes are food and coffee. But I want you to see that I love you more and I can give those up for you. I want to prove to myself that the things of the flesh can be overpowered with the Spirit. I succeeded because of His help. I wouldn't say that it was easy, but I realized it should have been a lot harder. I could have gone longer, and now I felt closer to God than ever. Now I was sure I actually knew Him. He really does live in me in some way, just as He said He would. The exact day that my mom left, I was compelled to check out the Toronto Pastor's YouTube, and he announced that for the first time ever, he's touring Canada and coming to my town. I immediately said, No way, Lord, really? The very man we spoke about that I wanted to baptize me so badly is coming here. I didn't know if he'd be baptizing on the tour or just preaching. I got no answers to my emails. All I knew was the day he'd be in Vancouver. Not even the time or location, that it, that just that it was going to be right after my planned fast ended. Again, somehow I caught a hint watching another local street preacher that baptisms were usually done at a particular beach downtown. I packed my bag and set out to sit all day at that beach to see if he showed up. As I had my hand on the doorknob, another strong urge to check the YouTube comments hit me and the pastor had just released his itinerary. He was set to be at the obscure mall, two blocks from my house, within the hour. I sat there and I waited in the plaza and I wondered when the protesters were going to show up. They'd been mobbing this pastor everywhere that he went, accusing him of hate speech and of targeting their community. Every time I thought to get up, I almost heard a voice commanding, stay here, and I sort of physically could not move off the bench. Nearly two hours went by and no event. Something must have gone wrong. I went back home and said, Okay, Lord, I think I heard you and obeyed you, but he wasn't there. I'll go down to the beach now, and if not, I'll go to Toronto after Mum gets home. Again, a strong draw to check the comments, and his crew had posted, Sorry, delayed, we're on the way now. I ran back to the plaza, met the pastor, and now knew the right time and place for baptism. I knew full well that this was going to be wild and possibly dangerous but I knew that Jesus would take care of me. As I neared the beach and I saw the hostile crowd, the Hail Satan sign, and a police wagon larger than I'd ever seen or knew existed, I kept walking and I remembered, you'll walk through the fire, but you will not get burned. Sure enough, I was safely and successfully baptized in a completely insane scene of silly string, dance music, pink smoke, rainbow flags, shrieking and F-words, surrounded by dozens of riot squad police and live stream to YouTube. I couldn't keep the smile off my face the whole way home. I knew the Lord had just once again answered my prayers, and he'd given me another incredibly enormous blessing. Rejoice when they revile you came into my mind. They hated me first. Mom came home and I couldn't stop thinking, if you're ashamed of me and my teaching, I'll be ashamed of you when I return. I told her everything I did and she did her best not to make side eyes at me while I said grace at the dinner table. I prayed repeatedly to God, I want to devote my life to you somehow, Lord, but I'm trapped by my circumstances. The thing a person spends the most time and energy on is what they worship. I want to serve you, Lord, not my mortgage company. I'd go live in a car if it were just me, but Mom needs my contribution. I prayed about this idea of moving to the Maritimes that Mom and I had talked about for years, which could solve this. I spoke to him about the Fundy region I had visited years ago and the beauty, the quiet, and the peace I felt in St. Andrews. I didn't want to go back to how things were before my three-week staycation with God. 
I'd never felt more at peace and more joy and contentment than just dancing around clumsily for God in the kitchen, singing songs to him horrendously off-key. I took seriously love the Lord your God with all your heart and didn't want to go back to parentheses unless a non-Christian is looking or I've got something else scheduled instead. Twelve days later, I was on a plane to Halifax with a reservation to quarantine in a hotel and absolutely no further plan, only a few weeks after my baptism. Now I've done some nutty things in my life, but I've been pretty calculating and so stable for over a decade now that it would put you right to sleep, actually. I don't make snap decisions like that on my own. I knew God had sent me, and he was granting my prayer again. I'd learned to believe in him, learned to know him, learned to love him, and now I was going to have to learn how to trust him. I was going to have to face my fears of not relying on myself to provide my needs. He was showing me that faith without trust is not faith. I prayed through the anxiety of blowing through the little money I had saved, having no place to go, no transportation, and not even sure if I could work due to the cost of data. The first day I looked online from my hotel room, the place I now live in jumped out at me. No way. In St. Andrews, of all places, there's actually something available for that price. It's fully furnished and ready right when I would need it. When I got here, I even knew right away that this church was the very one he wanted me to go in for some reason. I said, you and I are doing just fine on our own, aren't we, Lord? How about we just keep things this way until you return? I saw people going in, but I walked by and back again a few times saying, I don't know, Lord, maybe next week, maybe never. He seemed to have other plans again and kept drawing me back toward the church. Now the Lord is working on my heart. He's revealing things to me in the most simultaneously beautiful and irritating fashion. I realized that my hesitation walking into this place, as well as to tell you today about my past, was not that I thought you would all judge me. It was actually that you might accept me and take me in with the loving kindness that you already have since I got here. I am less afraid in an amphitheater filled with people that hate my guts than I am in a small room with those who genuinely care about me. I learned to guard my heart like Fort Knox to survive, but the Lord has busted right through it and the walls are crumbling down. The two things that God spoke into me the day he came to me after all were, I'll give you the truth, and you'll have to use your heart. I've come to know what all of you knew already. God does the unexpected and the amazing. He gives victory to the most unlikely people. He restores sight to the blind, enables the paralyzed to walk, and restores life to the dead. In His grace and my dumb luck, I am a collection of those very miracles right now because I was the most unlikely person that you would ever expect to be in this place saying these things. I was blind to God. Now I see his work everywhere. Once I was paralyzed with fear and anxiety, but now I know death itself has no power over me because of him. So why should anything else? I was dead inside and he offered me a way for both life abundant and life eternal. God gave the gift of absolute truth to a gigantic liar. He humbled and quieted a prideful loudmouth. He shone light where there was deep darkness. He radiated warmth into cold, hard stone. He started a heartbeat that died decades ago and set fire to a belly that had never been anything but an unfillable black hole. He gave the greatest hope of all to a person in hopeless circumstances since birth. To a person who always struggled in poverty, he gave this winning mega jackpot lottery ticket worth more than any sum of dollars or diamonds. The Lord took a woman who had absolutely nothing and handed her the keys to everything. This former unbeliever could not be more thrilled or more grateful to have been proven 
completely wrong. Thank you.